Uh, we're going to start that shortly, but uh, I'm going to kick off, kick off today's mm -hmm. webinar and introduce our presenter, uh, Rich Delisio. But uh, I am Jill Nagy Reynolds. I am with the SBA Columbus District Office, and I have the pleasure of working with the PTAC team on various trainings, uh, networking events, and uh, all kinds of activities that we try and, and put together so that uh, small business and government can meet with each other, uh, form partnerships, uh, form partnerships with other small businesses, uh, and this is an example of that. So. Uh, you may have attended some of our other webinar trainings. Uh, this is, uh, I think, the sixth that we're, we've done. Uh, but this, this particular training focuses on marketing to the government. So uh, this is it for those that have already registered in SAM that are familiar with uh, getting that started and then, okay, I've done all of my registrations, now what? How do I find opportunities? How do I market myself? Uh, how do I present my core capabilities to government agencies? So today's presentation will focus on that. Uh, if you have questions, I will be monitoring the chat feature of uh, Zoom government. So I will try and interject your question at uh, the right time. I'm not gonna interrupt Rich uh, if he's like mid-sentence or mid-thought. I'll try and find an appropriate time to uh, ask him the question. But uh, without further ado, it's always a pleasure to work with Rich Delici Delicio. He's the procurement specialist in Akron. I got it, like it just slipped a little bit, but uh, we've worked together for years. So uh, it, it's, uh, always great when to, when you have a team that really tries to uh, provide the best services that you know we can to small business so i'll go ahead and turn this over to you rich thank you Jim. good morning everyone i'm going to uh block my video so my my Fred glare doesn't bother you so um but I, you know i'm not going anywhere um first thing i'd like to do is thank jill uh and sharon hopkins our ohio university PTAC director for doing all the prep work. I just have to show up and talk, which uh, I have no trouble doing. And I would also like to thank my OU colleague down in uh, Lancaster, Mike Blythe, who helped me update these slides. He was my editor. We're, we're big on editing. I'll share that with you this morning. Um, but really, I would uh, really glad that you're here today. Um, first thing I'd like to do is share with you our basic acknowledgement. Um, this is our standard script to explain our program. PTAC is paid uh, by your tax dollars from the DLA, um, Ohio Development Services Agency, especially from the standpoint of helping small business and Ohio University. And there's the Ohio Business Matchmaker link uh, for you that, uh, to keep, keep that ready. Uh, the reason I am sharing that with you today is because I wanted to make sure that you're familiar with the, um, which I consider the programs, the webinars that uh, are very much related to what I'm going to talk about today. Um, the past events, the past record, uh, excuse me, the past webinars, most of them are on recording now. Check back at the site uh, if you were not able to listen in at the original broadcast. The recording is out there now for you, the uh, October 15th business readiness and the uh, beta.sam.gov and capability statement are all very much related to the marketing that, that I'm going to touch with today. And then on the um, uh, November 4th, the Wright Path and the DLA uh, Defense Supply Center Columbus uh, webinar is a double header day. Um, I think those are also very important, especially for those of you in manufacturing. So, you know, the, the thing that, that I think is very important is that, and, and Jill mentioned it earlier, that, you know, we, I think I are very fortunate that we have such great business resource partners like the SBA, SCORE, SBDC, and the PTAX across the state to assist each other in serving our, um, our database of clients. And, you know, I'm, I'm gonna have my information on the last slide if you wanna contact me afterwards. Please feel free to do that. Again, you, you, you know, your tax dollars pays my 
salary. I want to make sure I'm available for you. Um, if you are not familiar with PTAC, I can share that with you and also um, your counselor in, in you know, whatever part of the state you're involved. Hopefully, you know, in your state, if not, you know, we can direct you to uh, the PTACs and the other states too. But again, it's my pleasure to be here. I really think it's important that you have a good understanding of what we think is important. So I'm gonna to try to outline that here. Um, first of all, with our webinar agenda, I'm gonna to try to uh, touch on these subjects. Don't hesitate to ask questions. Uh, Jill and Sharon will be monitoring that. Uh, and you know, I don't have a problem with being interrupted along the way. I let Jill interrupt me. We prefer you keep your, um, uh, you know, your, uh, on mute. Uh, if I have a question that I can't answer, that's where I you know, go back to my resources of business partners and PTAC clients uh, across, across the state. So uh, again, feel free to let us know what you're thinking. Um, if I do not get to your question today, you of course can email me. And your question, if I don't have the answer, that is how I learn and I'm sure it'll come up again and I, when I deal with my 10 counties and, and my clients across uh, that, that area. So again, we're, we are constantly learning, constantly developing what we can do to help our companies uh, in this government market. Um, I'd like to also thank you for showing up today, you know, to take the time to step back and look at your government contracting efforts. You know, hopefully I can help you with your understanding and strategy uh, to bring more opportunities of your, you know, your match, your interests, uh, to, and really real dialogue to get you to fit with what's going on in that arena. Um, my point of reference is uh, I had 12 years at Youngstown State University as a procurement director, and for the past 11 years, I've been counseling in PTAC. You know, I've looked at, and we look at various professional development organizations, Institute of Supply Management, NCMA, which is National Contract uh, Management Association, our national PTAC group, APTAC. And you know, what I tell small owners, you know, when I was in charge of the university buying uh, you know, 12 years ago, and what I tell them now as a PTAC counselor is very similar. Be patient, be persistent, do your homework, build relationships, and be ready for that small opening. So you know, I'm gonna to try to keep this in orderly fashion, talk about the research and, and, and really recognize where you belong in your preparation, uh, some of your marketing development prep, websites and various things, how to become resourceful and fit. Uh, and again, that yes or no is gonna be from the acquisition and buyers. It's not gonna be from anyone else you know, it's not gonna be from PTAC, it's not gonna be from any other economic development person. The yes or no is gonna come from the uh, person that you wanna to sell to. And then bid or no bid, the assessment of opportunities, that's gonna be your yes or no. Where do you think uh, it makes a good idea for you to pursue? It's your time and your energy. So again, that's very important. Um, so this is what you know, my time procurement has taught me to emphasize the research prep, uh, early engagement, because it takes time to build relationships and to obtain, understand trust with the buyer, the acquisition staff, uh, and eventually the program manager that you have targeted for your service or product. The first thing I'd like to share is a traditional view of, of government acquisition. I think it's important uh, to start at that, at that point. Acquisition is always under a sense of urgency, uh, even more so with the pandemic. They feel pressure to streamline their process, uh, to keep low inventory, to keep cost uh, effective, you know, effectively and timely services. Acqu acquisition has to balance the seven R's on your screen right now. And this traditional view has to be addressed to get the best performance, and again, any agency is, good, is as good as its people. The buyer-seller relationship is also a balancing act, ranging from competitive to cooperative 
to collabor collaborative. And I think the right partner has to be an extension of framework because during year two of a five-year service contract, that base may get a new five-star general that has a new and improved viewpoint. So it's really the acquisition person that has to keep that contract moving forward uh, in, you know, in line with what that new five-star general has in mind. When I was at Youngstown State, I had five different bosses my last seven years. Uh, I had two, two presidents who wanted to change the structure. And I think that's important to understand a lot of times that, that constant mobility, constant change is part of what happens in government contracting on the acquisition side. And so luckily I had, I had one of the five different bosses that let me write some of the procurement guidelines that were approved by our board of trustees. And the last time I checked, they, they still have these three guidelines, which is important. The buyers and suppliers both want consistency, both want fairness. And if you are not getting that, you're better off avoiding that acquisition or buyer that you can't trust. I think you, know, you have to have that understanding and that should be part of your research to make sure it's worth your time, your energy, uh, you know, as you apply your, yourself to stay fit. So dealing with, excuse me, dealing with a lot of the issues moving forward, um, it's, you know, to their, again, acquisitions, to their advantage to stay with keeping the incumbent ways in when you do your research to, to provide you answers and understanding to those intangibles. And I think that, again, that's very important that you have their viewpoint in mind. So when you start your research and, and, and trying to recognize where you belong, we think it's the best to, to focus on a few. You know, don't go after, you know, 10 agencies. I think local location is always a good place to look, whether it's at the local level of city, university, county, state, and federal. You know, we were very fortunate to have uh, Wright Pat, the Defense Supply Center, and NASA Glenn in our state for, and, and there's all kind of other small uh, federal agency. Um, we have Ravenna Arsenal, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that's good to look locally first, uh, especially during the pandemic, you're seeing more and more local transaction, local relationships. So it's again, good to start with a few basic um, short, you know, short drives, so to speak, uh, to really get an understanding. Are they utilizing your product or service? You know, is it similar to where you have commercial success? Are you able to talk the same language? You know, you want to establish that relationship early. Are you able to talk, you know, that industry talk? It's very important. And so, you know, scale down your ambitions and begin narrowing the focus to a few that you can manage and work with. Once you have a pretty good idea on those three or four, then you start working a strategy and start making progress in, you know, where does your product or service match up? One of the keys, you know, that you want to feel that it's important, you wanna to get to that end user, that program manager, that contract administrator, um, it might be uh, an IT or facilities manager, the decision maker that signs off on that contract or that purchase order. That's really where you wanna have some conversation and you have to do that before that proposal goes out. And I think that, you know, one of the main things and one of the questions you want to ask, you know, what is missing from your contractors when you talk to these end users? What is your number one missing product or service? It may not be you, but if you know the industry and you have a good understanding of what they're looking for, make that suggestion to start building that relationship. You should gravitate industry leaders that are helpful as you build your resources. So as you start looking where you belong, look within your industry also uh, to get more knowledge, to become more of an expert. Make yourself available and make yourself understanding that it needs to be pursued before that public sector quote opportunity. I think that's very important. 
And again, you want to listen and learn as you move forward. I was at a NASA Glenn event, outreach event, a couple years ago, uh, and you know, I had a, a PTAC information table, and a contractor from New York came over and started talking to me. And he told me that he contacted Lockheed Martin 69 times. Okay, so I mean, you know, I thought that was pretty crazy, but he then told me that, uh, you know, he, they would not talk to him, but within two years, he, he started doing $2 million annually with them. And the reason I'm telling that story is he was patient and persistent, and he was spot on that he was a good match for Lockheed Martin. Um, it takes the average contractor 12 to 18 months to get their first federal government contract. Understanding that you have to build relationships, reduce that risk, get a good understanding of where you fit. And a lot of times it's with a small dollar contract or as a subcontractor. I think that's again that we've seen over the years. One of the things that we think you should start with is a research library. This is a good reference point when you start and a good reference point uh, as you move forward so that you are staying current and also that you understand the culture, especially at the federal level. Most of these sites are federal and uh, we're really gonna just focus today on, on federal with a few dabs into the state market. The first link is something that, that we share a lot. It's a government Google site. It's really great for acronyms, how to do business uh, with an agencies, how to do business with locations, et cetera. The FAR, uh, the Federal Acquisition Regulations, and, the, and the, it's really viable. This site will take you directly to all the reference pieces you need to know on government contracting, all the requirements, guidelines, Again, very important to have at your fingertips. The CFR is an online guide to all the rules published by departments and agencies of the federal government. The US code shows consolidation, uh, codification, uh, again, all the subject matter, general and permanent US laws. You may never need this, but this is nice to know when you, you know, if you have a lawyer that wants to have some fun. Uh, the Federal Register is the official daily publication of agencies' rules, proposed rules, uh, and notices, as well as presidential executive orders. Uh, DPAP is responsible for all the contracting and procurement policy for the DOD, as well as the pricing, uh, the contracting, and procurement policy matters, including the uh, DOD's e-business. Also involved DC, DPC, Direct and counter cynical uh, payment program uh, shares executive policies through the timely updates of the DFARS and PGI. PGI is the procedures, gu procedures, guidance, and information. Again, all those acronyms go back to that first site. Um, if you're looking for a government form, here's a good link the, the government contract forms, uh, a searchable database. Uh, most of those are. Uh, provided through the GSA, General Service Administration. And the bottom link here is a crazy DOD link that has all large contracts, over 7 million. Um, again, here's sub subcontracting opportunities. And these, this site is updated uh, each business day at 5 p.m. So it's really kind of cool and, and kind of current. And again, these are good for you to have at your fingertips for understanding. Uh, when you're talking about government contracting, when you're trying to learn, uh, so you have that access to that world at your fingertips. Also part of the marketing research is, for you uh, veterans, is the VBOC, which is the SBA uh, site designed to offer resources to the veteran-owned companies uh, across, uh, across America. The VBOC offers entrepreneurial development services such as business training, counseling, uh, uh, resource partner referrals, anything to do as far as helping you transitioning from a service member to the business world. Uh, the VBOC also facilitates the Boots to Business program 
which is strongly supported by our two SBA offices, our Columbus office with Jill, and also our Cleveland SBA office. And these are free services and uh, again, a very valuable uh, resource. resource. <laughs> uh, down below you have the veteran medical centers. Again, that is what, you know, if you're a VA, excuse me, a veteran owned company, you want to consider the VA as one of your top agencies to search because their, uh, their policy of uh, vet contracts first is ideal for you to look there first. And those links, very important, how they buy, what they buy. And then the bottom link is a link to their small business and where you get certified with that agency. The uh, SBA subcontracting opportunity directory is a listing of federal government contracts that have a requirement to have sub uh, excuse me, to small businesses to be subcontracting. This listing is intended for small business concerns who want to find subcontracting possibilities with the federal government prime contractors. The other than small business has an obligation to subcontract to small businesses, doesn't always mean that they are seeking new subcontractors. They may have teams of small business subcontractors. Therefore, this directory is not a guarantee that you will receive a subcontract opportunity. But again, you can use this directory as a tool to identify which businesses you should perhaps investigate, follow through with their recruiting processes, visit their website, and try to be an active participant in their pipeline for future contracts. The SBA recommends that you use this data to locate the Prime's website through an internet search to access the requirements to be a sub. If the sub, I'm sorry, if the firm doesn't have a website uh, through your search, contact the firm uh, for their website address. The directory also includes the name of the Prime, the product service code, the PSC code, the NAICS code, uh, name and telephone number, point of contact, uh, contract number along with the effective date and completion date and also should include the contract value obligated dollars. You know, do not ask, no, don't contact the firm to ask for the subcontracting possibilities before viewing their website or with their current contract. It's just an opportunity to understand how to do business with them and how you have to present yourself uh, as part of the solution. Your due diligence will also help if you can provide a capability statement designed specifically for that target firm. And we, you know, we had a nice program the other day on capability statement. You're going to want capability statement ready for the various talks you have at the Ohio Business Matchmaker, whether it's a federal agency, a uh, prime or state agency. But again, Careful research of the firm, get a total understanding of how they do business, how you may reach out to them, how to get in contact with their small business officer if they have one. But again, spend the time to research, make sure you fit, then pursue the contact. Uh, the part of this is, is also becoming more difficult because I know three of my primes in my Akron area, they no longer staff a small business development person, they require each business development person, they're, you know, again, across the country or have territories, uh, regions across the country. And these business development uh, chiefs maintain their own local or regional subs. So that makes it more difficult not to have one central person. Again, you have to do the research and find that person that again is going to make that selection for the sub. Uh, it helps us in Ohio to be around Wright Pat, to be around NASA Glenn, because especially in areas of construction or IT, they're going to want a local subcontractor to visit the site. I hope that makes sense to you, okay. <laughs>
Also, part of the SBA involvement is the subnet subcontracting network system. This also bridges the gap between businesses seeking subcontracting opportunities and facilitated uh, by matching the subcontractor with the opportunities. These postings of opportunities are also part of our PTAC bid match service. So if you are a PTAC client, you should be familiar with our bid match service. This subnet is part of that. And so by your Google search, you would get this information. And if you're you know, not familiar with PTAC, please send me an email. I'll be glad to share this information with you. But again, it's very important to understand that there's information out there uh, in this arena. Does it happen? Yes. Does it happen every day? No. But again, start locally, start within uh, the people that you know, the resources that you're dealing with in your industry to help maybe get you involved and get a better understanding of where you match up. Also part of your market research should be the GSA. Uh, this is the e-library e site and it gives you access to every schedule holder and provides their contact information, categories, uh, price list, contract number. This is a great resource tool if you're going to consider the GSA schedule for yourself. You can model your pricing, job descriptions, et cetera, study the competition. Uh, and we, we as PTAC can also assist by running reports on the successful contractors. And those, those are really the ones you want to model. But this is a great opportunity to understand how to market yourself, uh, not only to the agencies, but to the firms already on the schedule. You may have a new exciting uh, medical product, let's say, and you want to introduce that product to a, a veteran-owned, service-abled vet with VA hospital contracts, contacts. They may be interested in adding your new product. Being a subcontractor with a GSA schedule holder is a great way to utilize the schedule without having to go through the process of getting on the schedule yourself. Uh, and, and once you're on the schedule, really it's, it's a hunting license and you really have to spend a lot of time marketing yourself. So for very small firms, it's not easy, okay? So it's a commitment of time to do research. It's even more of a commitment of marketing time once you're on the GSA schedule. Also, as a, as a potential marketing research avenue, a vehicle, other transaction authority, OTAs. This is used by the federal government really to reduce red tape and allow the government to quickly and efficiently acquire research and prototyping services to products. The spend for OTAs has increased dramatically over the last couple of years, as you can see on our slide. This increase suggests federal government is using this type of contracting to expedite awards, especially in technology and expand its non-traditional contractors. This enables the agencies to invest and influence technology development, which is sometimes very slow moving in the federal market. Really, this is something to keep an eye on, especially that the, the military is moving a lot of their pilot programs through this process to avoid the bid process and end up implementing the program for that non-traditional contractor over a two or three year period. One of the things that I do uh, with PTAC I have a, a data tool and I'll share with you uh, shortly called FedMine. And I track first time federal contracts uh, in Ohio. And recently we had a contract in Columbus and one in Dayton area, both with their first contract over $2 million. Both of these contracts were COVID-19 related, but for to have your first contract over $2 million, trust me, it doesn't happen every day. And if they had past performance as a sub, I'm not really sure of that, but they had something the government wanted and the government didn't want to wait. And I think that's very important to understand, especially through the pandemic, 
the government is extraditing and moving quicker um, as you would expect. And I think that's gonna be true of all the markets uh, during the pandemic. So keep that in mind too. This site offers forecasting for about two dozen federal agencies, um, such as Department of Agriculture, Defense, Homeland Security, Energy. Agencies are required to have forecasts of future opportunities uh, in order to know how much money they need to ask for Congress and they need to be posting it here. While creating the forecast, also begin market research on their own, identifying potential firms to perform some of that work. This gives you the chance to begin your forecasting pipeline uh, as part of your developing marketing plan. I, I really like this site, not just for the forecasting, but because it provides the agency's vendor communication plan, small business contact, you know, how to do business link um, with some direction on, again, on, on the site. Uh, and some agencies, some agencies are better than others. Um, HUD, for one, updates their forecast monthly. Uh, most of these are easy to filter by program, uh, program office, by NAICS, by contract type, and by dollar value. So again, it's a, it's a very good site, especially for those 12, excuse me, for those 12 agencies, if they match up to you. So again, we want you to do a lot of research. We want you to pretty much stay the course, so to speak, of developing your marketing plan. By now, you should have narrowed your search a little bit. Uh, this DOD site here provides a list of the small business offices uh, and also contacts for you and links to their website. So, and this site really has amazing content. Uh, and again, one of the things that we recommend uh, when I talked about the VA, when I talk about uh, any federal agencies, you want to talk to the small business officer, small business liaison. That's a great starting point. Besides the dozen of small business offices, this site, the very top site, I'm referring to the DOD site, uh, also provides deep dives into marketing, cybersecurity, COVID-19, and their socioeconomic goaling. So those of you that have, you know, the military definitely should be of interest to you because they have the largest budget. If that's a good match for you, this is a site that you should dive into deeply and visit on a regular basis. The agencies that you find as a potential match should be investigated, not just from the, the small business liaison, but you also want to you know, do as much reporting, get as much reporting uh, on how they meet the various small business goals. Um, these small business liaisons should be small business advocates, and you really want a relationship there. It's not easy, they're not always available, but again, you hope to have some influence. And what I mean by influence, you want to be able to, to come across as someone that's procurement ready, a fit for that agency, a fit for that location. Maybe you can get 15 minute call with the program manager. Influence with the small business uh, liaison so, so they can maybe include your set aside, whether it's a socioeconomic or just small business overall, in their market research. If you can get them to, you know, to put something out as a small business set aside, as a hub zone set aside, then you have a better chance you're reducing the competitive selection process. And, and once, you know, once you have that relationship, you may need that later on, getting paid from a, a, a prime, um, getting some you know, information that uh, will help you as a, you know, from a sub to a prime, um, you know, they don't make the buying decision, but they can definitely make you more visible. And I think that's one of the things that you have to have as a goal. To be fit, you have to be visible. You have to be on their radar in any fashion, small, sub, whatever it may be. But again, you want some visibility to know that you are getting the opportunities. 
And Rich, we have a question. Uh, oh. Yeah, we have a question in the chat. So uh, the question is, are there similar links to marketing? Uh, the, like, for example, the one that you've posted for marketing to the DOD, do they have similar links at agencies like Health and Human Services, Department of the Interior? Yeah, the acquisition site will have that information. On, 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 so the DOD is covered really on this site and this site here, the acquisition, for the, especially for those 12 are gonna have all that information there. So this website here will take them to like more of the, the non-DOD agencies? Right, right, exactly. Uh, homeland, agriculture, I really like agriculture. Um, HUD, uh, I'm not sure about commerce, but there's a lot of good sites. Uh, and if you can't find them there, go to their homepage and you should, should be able to find a small business person there. That would be a good thing for your PTAC counselor to pursue and, you know, and get that information to you and also shared with all of us. But I rely on this acquisition and this DOD site. Great, thank you. But again, the small business liaison is is really, hopefully, is going to just, you know, they're gonna they're gonna help the best and the brightest small businesses show that they are qualified, you know, show that their experience and innovative ideas are something that does indeed support the agency's mission requirements. But I, I mean, getting a small dollar contract is the way you want to go. And it's, again, it's very easy. One of my contractors had a NASA Glenn person stop along the way, on the way home, and he bought some things in their um, retail establishment, and that was their first contract a couple years ago. I mean, it happened, you know, it's humans, human nature and little things like that are a good st starting point. So again, always look locally, always look through the small business advocate, and you know, my understanding and, and my 10 years, I, I feel very strongly that we have very good small business liaisons in our state. They're always gonna be available? No. Are they gonna think you're a good match all the time? No. That's, that's up to you to get yourself fit. Please understand that. Also on this page, you know, I listed the Defense Innovation Initiative. That is really, you know, if you are interested in being a sub for someone like Boeing, that's where they look, that's where their involvement is. Uh, so, you know, again, if that's a potential match for you, you know, this, you know, DII is Boeing's favorite, it should be your favorite. Please, please keep that in mind. When you do research, you have to dig deep and dive into as much information as possible. Utilize your PTAC uh, office also, because again, anything that, that you're looking at and you share, it's also something that we can share across the state. We can learn and get and be more effective in serving not just yourself, but other people. And again, that's, that's what our job is. And, we, and it's fun, really, it's fun to do the research. The research tool that I mentioned earlier and that I utilize a lot is the FedMind. And again, this is where your tax dollars pays for this FedMind service. It's a business intelligent platform. It is 16 data sources of federal procurement into one. These, you know, these are the main things I use it for. I use it for keyword search, uh, agencies, contracting officers, uh, NAICS by contracting officer location, expiring contracts. I run the uh, competitors, uh, especially for their item description a lot. This shows good detail for my clients. It shows the contract type some potential bid match keywords. And again, the other reports that, that I utilize, a lot of times I use a three year history to, to get understanding and to show, you know, what they've been doing at that agency, at that contracting officer, to see if, do they do some small business set aside, sources sought? Do they do the items that fit under your NAICS? You know, they have the general NAICS, but is it specifically a good match for you? That's a good place to start. Will that contracting officer talk to you? Maybe, maybe not, you know? It's cold calling, it's just like anything else. 
But again, that information hopefully puts you in the right direction. Two reports that I ran recently um, for the, uh, you know, the WSOB, Women-Owned Small Business Set Aside, I have that by NAICS and by, um, you know, set aside dollars. Um, and, and you can see, you know, the NAICS codes, um, you know, uh, other than computer services, 541519, other than management services, management consulting services, 541618, and the third one, uh, industrial laundry shops, 812322. Those are the top three. Number five was engineering uh, on the list, I remember. Um, but again, if you are a, w, a woman owned small business, you may consider those NAICs, especially the 541 NAICs. Uh, it doesn't have to be your prime, but it, it is something that you may want to list in your SAM and then you know, look for partners, look for staffing that fits in those areas that you can utilize. And then if you are in those NAICs, you may consider teaming with a woman-owned small business on this data. See the large set-aside amounts, you know, it, it really speaks well for HHS and GSA because percentage-wise, that is way stronger than what you're seeing from the large defense budget. The other uh, research tool that we use uh, the proxy is really for that manufacturing client. And I've also listed uh, dibs, which is where you look for the manufacturing uh, opportunities, uh, defense internet bid board system. That will be highlighted on our November 4th, 2 p.m. webinar, I'm sure, if that's a match for you as far as manufacturing. But that proxy is based on national stock number uh, research. When I have my clients, you know, they'll read me the solicitation number and I would tell them, I, just give me the uh, national stock number. And I have clients that have, you know, their, their, their own, you know, through years of being involved in the federal government, they have NSNs assigned to them where they are the, 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 the source. And so it's good for them to keep those, excuse me, to keep those in their research base for, you know, I, I run reports on them, um, or if they, if they are looking at a, a different type of NSN, I can run reports on that for them too. So that's, that's again, some of the things that we do uh, from the research side to assist our clients. Very important to understand that this is just a nice research tool. Take advantage of it. Uh, we have it across the state. We have other type of research tools. Uh, you know, some of the other counselors don't use FedMind. They have other, uh, you know, different type of reporting that's comparable and that's, you know, what they're used to using. But this is what I use on a daily basis. So I'm going to take a little, little side road here and go to some market research that is not federal. And the two places that I, that I want to highlight here are the uh, non-federal, the state, and the higher education. I really like the state site, the, the top one. It's very comprehensive. Uh, you're able to click on your, your, the state of choice, find contract information, uh, it lists state contracts, begin end date, contact information. Uh, you know, I have a contractor from Medina County she does a lot of work in Iowa and Arizona state. And it's, you know, it's been over the years. She's been with me. Um, you know, she was ecstatic when she got her first Ohio award in 2019. She does HR testing and consulting. So some of it is virtual. Some of it is on site. And again, just like the federal government, state agencies have similar buying habits. It's the state has their, excuse me, most states follow the same uh, fiscal year, July 1st to June 30th. The federal fiscal year, October 1st to September 30th. That's very important to understand. So the buying habits, they have to spend the money at the end of those fiscal years or they lose it. So there's a lot of activity, the final 
two months of their fiscal year. And a lot of times you have to be ready for those new strong opportunities at the start of the fiscal year, because through the forecasting or, or through your understanding of, you know, every, government buying, there's a strong habit, strong routine. They have certain things they do each fiscal year. Uh, when I was at the university, we had, you know, basically the same budget every year. You know, some reductions and some movement, but for the most part, through tax dollars, those budgets stay very firm. And so understand that and understand the patterns and the opportunities match up accordingly. Public universities that are listed in the National Association of Ed Educational Procurement, um, they have regional conferences. They have uh, usually have one um, national conference. I held one of the regional conferences uh, 20 years ago. I don't wanna tell you how old I am, but I'm pretty old. But so I had a small program at the time uh, at the, the Youngstown Visiting Center. Again, their, their incubator, um, we probably have 19 incubators across the state, I'm guessing on that number. But I know a few years ago we had 13, I think we have more now. But one of the uh, innovative companies um, that I, I presented, you know, I was looking for things to do uh, for the weekend. And so I thought, oh, I'll go down and take them down the incubator, they're all business people, they'll love it. Well, one of the, the innovative companies got an Ohio State University contract within three months. I had to do it. I had the company make a presentation. The Ohio State uh, purchasing director liked it and, it, and you know, it took off from there. Uh, this company, it's called Turning Technologies, they started small in the incubator. Now they are next door to the incubator in their own building uh, because they're so large. And, and thankfully, they stayed in the Youngstown area. But again, why did this happen? Simple, direct approach. This company had a niche, you know, a new thing in technology. You know, other people will tell you if you're good. Other people will tell you if they like it, especially at the government, and especially since they can do a quick purchase. Whether it's a university, whether it's a federal agency or city county, if it's below the uh, bid, bid dollar amount, they want to try it out, that's an ideal way to start. So please keep that in mind you know, keeping it simple and direct also. The other part of market research that I wanna share with you is uh, what we have here in Ohio. We talk about Ohio universities. That last link is uh, for state universities. Uh, Inter-University Inter Council, PG, IUCPG. Um, that highlights the public entities, but it also lists the contacts for all the privates. They have price agreements uh, that they bid out regularly. So again, one of the first steps, you want to register as a supplier if you're interested in doing work uh, at the um, state level. If you want to do work at the individual university or college, you would have to register there. Again, part of the commitment, part of the time. Is it local if it's a match? to what you think you, you know, have and belong. You have to commit time uh, to be registered, to be ready for those opportunities. So also on this uh, page, we have a uh, statewide listing um, as far as counties, uh, agencies, federal agencies, state agencies. Um, I share that with, with the, all my new clients. Um, spend the time to do research, spend the time to register. Um, how do they buy individually? Do they utilize cooperative agreements? That's really a lot of your first steps. The state of Ohio procurement uh, is listed here and also Ohio buys, which is their new e-procurement system. And they're trying to move everything non-construction into that e-procurement system. That's a way for the state to manage their spending to hopefully utilize one system across the state, they utilize in their classific classification system, the UNSPSC codes, uh, which is also part of their business gateway system. If you are a 
MBE, EDGE, or WBE, you already have those uh, UNSBC codes. Uh, and again, those are necessary for that uh, e-procurement system. Review the link. They have a nice uh, link for training, supplier information. Uh, my understanding is that uh, November 5th, they expect to roll out phase three of their Ohio uh, implementation system. And I'm hoping and planning to do a webinar early next year on this subject. Let them work out the, the kinks over the winter and uh, hopefully I'll have some good information for you uh, early next year. But again, look local, look within the state, not just the federal government. Here we list the uh, small business goals and what I think it should be really is your first contract focus. The goals for agencies are also part of the responsibility of primes who must contribute to these agency goals and that's very important for you to understand. As a small business, look at the idea of starting out under that SAT threshold amount. And what that is, the simplified acquisition threshold dollar amount is the same as the small business set aside for general small business and also for the four socioeconomic categories listed on, on the slide here. So any contract that is being presented as an opportunity that is under 250,000 has to be a set aside for small business. And a lot of times the market research will point to one of those four categories and not just you know, small business overall. It's also to good understand that from the standpoint of capacity and what you can manage, it is also good to start there with a small dollar contract. And that to me is part of that, what I call the fitness test. You really wanna make sure you fit. You wanna start small and that small can be as a prime on a small dollar contract or as a sub to a, a, a prime a large contract <clears throat> this is the way you know you should look at it from the standpoint of establishing strong past performance strong reference point if you're dealing with a prime you should be more interested in learning, you know, help, help get a good understanding of the contract obligation. You get the experience and you get that reference point to build on. And if you can be involved with the prime, that may lead to other contracts also. Hey, Rich, we have a, an 8A question. Uh, okay. So I, I can answer that one. Okay. Uh, I've heard that you should join, I, I'm sorry, I've heard that you should only join 8A if you already have a contract in mind or a contract you're already pushing to bid on. Can you shed more light on 8A contracts or bid opportunities? Uh, and that's from Jared Smith. Uh, Jared, I'm a business opportunity specialist at the Columbus District Office. I work primarily with 8A companies. I wouldn't say that we push a lot for companies to wait until they have a contract in mind. That's too late. Uh, it's more along the lines of uh, considering 8A once you have your feet wet in government procurement. Uh, the reason why I say that is because we get a lot of companies that uh, want to register for the 8A program without any understanding of federal procurement. So. Uh, the, the program is not a guarantee of a contract. It's a very helpful tool as uh, Rich is going over just the, the set asides for uh, uh, SBA contracting programs, including 8A. Uh, but being strategic about when you apply is very important because it's the only program that has a nine year window for participation. So what I mean is uh, once your company is certified in the 8A program, uh, that company will be in the 8A program for nine years, and so it's a one-time deal. Uh, so a company can't put their certification on hold, uh, and also the company can't reapply for 8A down the road. So if that company's participated in the 8A program once, that's it for life. 
as is the individual upon whom eligibility is based, they can only participate in the 8A program once. So uh, I wouldn't say a particular contract in mind so much as having an understanding of uh, federal procurement before considering applying. I hope that answers your question. Okay, and I'm sorry, Rich, I got a second question here. Can woman owned be considered if 8A, uh, I'm sorry, can woman owned be considered 8A if you're not a minority? So the two programs are separate. You can be qualified for woman owned small business, but not qualified for 8A. Uh, the general eligibility requirements for 8A is that a company has to be 51% owned and controlled by a U.S. citizen who is also socially and economically disadvantaged. So that is an and. Uh, the social disadvantage is belonging to one of four key designated groups, including African American, Hispanic, Native American, and Asian American. Or if you don't belong to one of the four key designated groups, uh, you would have to complete the preponderance of evidence. So that is giving examples to the SBA of uh, discrimination and hardship. And I can send you uh, the information regarding uh, uh, the social disadvantage and I can email it. I'll actually put it in the chat. Uh, but um, you have to, to demonstrate discrimination or hardship around, the, uh, uh, around lack of access to education, employment, or capital. And uh, the, more, uh, the more examples that you have that can be uh, proven, so for example, if there was a civil lawsuit or if you have witnesses that can say, yes, there was discrimination because of gender or because of uh, where you grew up or uh, there, there, then that makes a stronger preponderance of evidence case. Um, what about EDWOSB? Is that the same as 8A? No. Uh, economically disadvantaged women-owned small business. Uh, here's where it gets a little, little, little hairy. So uh, for the women-owned small business program, the federal level, this is just for federal contracts. It's divided into uh, NAICS codes and some NAICS codes uh, the government determined to be woman-owned and some are economically disadvantaged woman-owned. So for woman-owned small business uh, categories, women are considered to be substantially underrepresented. So in the case where women are considered to be substantially underrepresented, they don't have to be economically disadvantaged. So in they, that case, the woman business owner does not have to uh, be below the $750,000 threshold uh, for participation in the federal program. So economically disadvantaged women owned means that under that particular NAICS code category, women are underrepresented but not substantially underrepresented. So the woman business owner has to be economically disadvantaged as well. So if that's the case, then uh, when the woman business owner is applying for the federal program, uh, that owner has to include their tax returns, tax returns and financial statements to demonstrate that they have a net worth that is below 750,000. So there have been changes to the woman owned small business program, major changes this year. Oh, of course my phone rings. So, uh, the, the major changes include the fact that the SBA is now certifying women-owned small businesses that started on October 15th of this year. So it's brand new. Uh, women used to self-certify. Now SBA is providing decisions on certification and uh, women-owned businesses, if they uh, have already gone through a third-party certifier, that third-party certification is still valid. Okay, uh, hopefully that answers some of the questions. It looks like there's a couple more questions about 8A that I can answer um, as well. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, and there's one other message that I'll just go ahead and message you, uh, Jared. All right, Rich, sorry about that. No, don't be sorry. I like it. I had a nice break. I went went to the restroom and everything. Yeah, else. you got to so, get a drink and whatnot. Yeah, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> 
can I, I'd like to reinforce what, what Jill, I'd like to reinforce it from my viewpoint. Nine years goes fast. You don't want to spend the first two years of the nine years developing relationships, you know, across the agencies or across the whatever uh, during that time. So one of the things you can do is look, you know, and, and one of the best sites is the Dynamic Small Business Search, look for potential 8A partners in, in your NAICS code. Uh, and again, if you're an expert in your industry and you can spend some time doing research, try to go to trade shows, try to develop your relationships, you can get involved as a sub to the 8A and flip it when it comes time for them to graduate, be out of the program, and you're entering the program. So that's, that's something to keep excellent. in mind yes. from a standpoint. Again, that is just like looking for a prime. It happens, it doesn't happen every day, but that, that is where you have to, you know, have that, that you know, and, and again, one of the things in developing relationships, your word better be gold. You better have a, a good understanding that it's a commitment uh, early on commitment where you're not making money, so to speak, as much as you're gaining knowledge and gaining relationships for the long term. So, so, so please keep that in mind. But again, you know, the SBA, great resource partner for us in PTAC, especially Jill and Shonda, because they went through our PTAC program and they have a great understanding of what we do on a daily basis. Take advantage of that and also take advantage of other people across the state you know, we're all in the help small business in Ohio, you know, and, and, it's, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's rewarding. Wanna, yes, it is. And, and so uh, any opportunities that we have to bring businesses together and government to business together, we will do. Uh, I did have another comment about the 8A program. Uh, a question was, how can I find out if there are opportunities in my industry uh, I would find I would say through this presentation is a good start on how you can go on your own to see if there are opportunities in your industry meeting with PTAC also to support the efforts as you're putting into uh, market research will help. Uh, but if you if you're finding opportunities under your under your core capabilities, then most likely there will be 8A opportunities as well. So. 8A is different uh, from the other small business programs in that it is a business development program. So there are contracts in the 8A program that stay in the 8A program. Uh, SBA is constantly having to uh, fight to keep those contracts in the 8A program, uh, but that's neither here nor there. But there's also the ability of contracting officers to award contracts in on behalf of an 8A participant uh, into the 8A program. Uh, so that's that would be uh, something that's done between the business opportunity specialist, the, the 8A participant and the agency. Uh, but I highly recommend first that you spend time uh, getting to know federal procurement, uh, identifying the agencies that buy what you sell, meeting with PTAC, finding out what your acquisition strategy is going to be and then pursuing 8A because like Rich said, you'll spend the first two years of 8A of your certification figuring that stuff out and you don't get those two years back and it goes fast. Uh, we have an awful lot of firms right now that are just, even with COVID, they're saying, hey, can I get an extension because of COVID? Uh, an extension in the 8A program takes an act of Congress so Congress would have to say, oh, okay, well, we're just gonna go ahead and make a change. One of the, the biggest ones that I've heard over the years is the time in 8A shouldn't start until you get your first contract instead of upon certification, but it's not how it works. It just isn't. Um, I'm, and there's another question about woman-owned small business. I will tell you that the certify SBA certify system is is uh, uh, having some some uh, it's not growing pains because certify has been around for a while, but it's it's having some issues. Uh, so I will take your question and take a closer a closer look at it. It's pretty technical, so uh, 
Uh, if you're having trouble trying to upload your documentation into the into certify you're not alone. Uh, not that that's very comforting, but I'll, I'll take a look at this uh, message here from Sarah and see how best to respond. All right. All right, Rich, we can get started. Okay. All right. So simplified acquisition, again, is something that we think you should look at. It's really built for businesses. That should be your approach, especially again, for that first contract. Um, Simplified acquisition threshold means the agency can get three quotes. It does not have to go through a formal six week process. Uh, it doesn't have to have all that administrative costs, uh, especially during the pandemic, we're seeing a lot of this. Um, they do their market research and they can find the contractors for that opportunity. Two of my PTAC clients got their first federal contract through the SAT, uh, December of 2019. Since then, they probably both have had three or four contracts. All small dollars, some of them over the, the threshold, maybe 400,000, which I think is great. I don't think that's small. But, but again, that first award, that should be based on your research, based on your commitment of building relationships. It takes time. Something that as you do your research, you kind of build a portrait, you know, you should be able to visualize where you belong and what is the best starting point for you. And that's by listening, learning, building that understanding, building relationships, being patient and persistent. You know, the thing I told everybody when I was at YSU 20 years ago that I'm telling everybody that I've been doing since PTAC, really be patient and persistent and find a good fit when you do research you should become more confident in where you belong and that's when you take the time uh, to find those necessary relationships and resources so and, and this again this is where you try to make that research to be in a resourceful fit also small dollar micro purchase threshold mpt that's from 3500 to 10,000 make sure your company is able to use government cards credit cards that they use to buy um, you want to emphasize that uh, in your sam profile you want to also hit and 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 focus on your capability statement um, what small dollar focus contracts you can provide uh, we recommend a lot of times on your one page document to use the flip side to emphasize contracts you can do under 10,000, under 25,000, under 100,000, whatever it may be. If you're a service, you know, what type of investment can you do under $5,000? And again, this is where your small business focus has to come into play. You know, you are small, you want to stay small, at least at the beginning, okay? And you want to emphasize that in your research and understanding. Don't look at the $2 million contracts that you have to compete with the primes, unless you've had a commercial contract in that range. That micro purchase threshold is an easy start. State of Ohio also has something similar to that. They call it quick buys under 2,500. And that's part of their Ohio buys that we mentioned earlier. And again, you want to go after some of these quick buys with state. It's a one page registration that you go back and fill out, you know, they, they, they contact you to fill out the rest of the information later, which again, puts you in their system under those codes that you match up. And that's again, of finding opportunities for yourself that fit your fitness test is to get a positive response from spending the time by getting opportunities in these small dollar ranges, okay? You don't wanna spin your wheels, you don't wanna chase pennies by going after proposals that take you seven days to figure out and spend all the time and you're not gonna make that much profit. But you address these small dollars like you address your commercial accounts because you're familiar 
with what your company does for 30,000, what your company does for 75,000. Hey Rich, and I've again, got a couple more questions along the lines of what you were just mentioning. So uh, how do we see listings of contracts that qualify for the simplified acquisition uh, threshold or ones that are below that? Well, that again, part of it, you request it on your own, but all set-asides for small business are under that dollar amount. So it may be a competitive selection or it may not, and it can't hurt you to contact the contracting officer if they do the market research and, you know, is it a woman-owned small business set aside? Let them know you're a small business, so you have to submit your proposal and also stay in contact with that contracting officer. The other thing is through the FedMine research, you can see doing set-asides and they're more inclined to maybe look at doing a simple quote if you're qualified. Again, if you're qualified in their eyes, and to approach them with that idea. Hey, and when you go to your matchmaker, hey, do you guys do SAT where you just get pricing from three contractors? That could be one of your questions. Uh, again, if you do the research on the person, on the, comp on the agency beforehand, you might be able to get some of that information, but it's also not a bad thing to try to find out. And again, you should be in that socioeconomic category and you should be qualified and a good match for that agency. I am not this popular. But on, okay. on, on contract review uh, or on contract officer, contract location, you can see um, SAT is one of the vehicles listed when you dive into the data. I can, I can show that to people if, they, if they're interested. So what I'm hearing, Rich, is the, the FedMine, that, that's something that they would, uh, uh, when they're meeting with a PTAC counselor one-on-one, -on -one, uh, uh, the, the PTAC counselor could help them with a FedMine search, uh, and that can provide uh, valuable information. But also, when you, like Rich said, when you're meeting with the uh, buyers at, 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 for your matchmaker virtual uh, meetings, you can ask, do, do you often buy under the simplified acquisition threshold? How do I find out information about that? Um, okay, another comment, it's not clear what's meant by what contracts we can support on the back of our capabilities. Well, again, that is something that, something you can look at. I can share with you at a model. I can show you what some of my contractors would do it. It's really not that hard. On the front side, basic information, if you listen to Jane's program the other day, um, we're seeing we're on the flip side, again, the second page flip side on a two page document, PDF, um, you break it down, you can list your focus of what you sell commercially under 10,000 or under various dollar amounts to show that this is what I do on a regular basis, I could do it for the government but they can send me, send me an email and I'll share a model with them. Okay, thank you. All right, I really, I'm, I wanna get through all these slides. So again, I, you know, I'll be available. Um, we have great PTAC counselors across the state. It's, it's really not, you know, when I, when I talk about putting that information on the flip side, that is something that, you know, I first heard that at our national conference in November. I thought it was a great idea and I've seen the results pay off already. Um, the other thing is there's other avenues and other vehicles that I'll share with you later so you have a better understanding of that. So I'm gonna move on. Okay, so we've talked about different resources and, and now you really have to um, build you know, what you, you know, you know where you, you know, you have a very good idea where you belong. You've done your research, you start building relationships. These are some of the things that you have to keep in mind and you have to be, I think, resourceful. And again, be very like a fitness test and also try to remain fit. So you got to keep exercising. You got to stay in your swim lane to be a subject matter expert, SME, subject matter expert, okay? Uh, the other thing I like to share with, with, with people all the time is, you know, as a business owner or if you work for a small firm, 
I mean, you, I'm sure you get shot down a lot, but a no in the government is just like a no in any other commercial or private side of the economy. You know, you have to have a short memory, you have to be optimistic, and, and don't lose sight of your operations, of your regular sales and customers. So a lot of the, the repetition, you know, that goes into establishing yourself in the federal market also means you keep seeking improvement in what you do. You seek a better understanding. You know, one of the biggest losses during the pandemic is the, the networking, the informal discussions. You have to do that on your own more. So you have to do it with, with Microsoft Teams, Zoom, phone calls, whatever, you know. And, and that's really up to you to do that. Um, one of the benefits of COVID is that more purchasing is done locally. And so keep that in mind, turn, excuse me, to look locally. The intensity that we think you should have really is in your research. You know, don't spend time complaining about officials that don't return phone calls or tell you that you're not a good match. You know, if they, you know, they may give you an explanation, they may not, you don't have to buy it. I mean, it's just like anything else, you know. It's a waste of time, really. You're not gonna make it fit if you worry about all the notes or if people don't call you back. That's just the nature of what you, you deal, deal with that everywhere. So your prep along with your experience should have a lot in dealing with what your understanding is and what you want to be as a subject matter expert. So you stay in that, in that lane. You want of time to build relationships and resources. Opinion, it, it's just like, you know, you, it takes time to build your company. It takes time to build those resource relationships. Early business development is, is important to do that. And that's how you find opportunities, not also the ones that are posted, but that, that you hear phone channels. And so you develop these relationships, these resource people, you trust, you check in with them regularly, you get suggestions, you get introductions, you know, they are experts in your field. The job might be too small for their corporate company, not too small for you, may not be something that's promising, doesn't matter, you wanna take it for the experience. You know, as you grow, as you get turned down, as you get in situations that, you, you know, lessons learned, that's when you start saying no, that, that kind of means, okay, you arrived at, you know, where you fit. And that might take, you know, that might take five or seven years, folks. It doesn't happen overnight. You might get lucky, get a small contract, you're gonna have your ups and downs, but that happens all, all the time. So you gotta learn from everything you can, you ask questions, you know, you go to the research on the internet, whatever, and you become more, you know, informed, you have a better understanding of where you fit, and you'll make decisions, effective decisions, really without blinking. As you get older, you rely on your, on your memory, on your experiences to move you forward, and, and keep that in mind, people that are older, like me, they'll share that information and it's helpful. And business is business. You have to develop your marketing tools. That includes the capability statement. That includes your dynamic small business search profile. You have to focus on your references, your past performance. That's because that's what's coming in the market more and more. They look at that strongly. If you don't know a capability statement is a company rate, to express your expertise, your references, how to separate yourself from your competition, your brand. The dynamic small business search, that's part of your, um, you know, it's kind of like a capable statement online. That's utilized sometimes by contracting officers. I have a, uh, a service-abled vet a couple years ago, got their first contract because uh, a New Jersey, uh, BA officer was looking for information assurance in his keywords, information assurance through the dynamic small business search. My client had that listed, it has to do with cybersecurity training. Okay, very simple thing to do to have, but he got that 
first contract and it was around 36,000. He had some subcontracting experience. You know, as a veteran, he had old ties, which helped him. But again, that $36,000 contract on a service-abled vet set aside under 250,000, it was a SAT because the, the contracting officer just did uh, a three, three company quote that he found in Dynamic Small Business Search. And that service-abled vet was able to duplicate that contract across other states, very similar dollar amount to other VA clinics that were using the same training uh, you know, um, session. So again, utilize those simple things, make sure you're up to date, make sure you, you, you have those populated and have other people look at them to proof them for you, people in the industry, people in government contracting, you know, take, you know, PTAC, SBA, you know, they have, you know, an extra set of eyes and ears for you also, but you want to utilize what's at your hand, you know, what's free, social media, local media, utilize local economic development leaders to help get your message out. They should make you more resourceful. Maybe they find opportunities. Um, the link on this page is a free site I share a lot. It's economic development news across the state. Uh, these are positive announcement, announcements. Uh, they're a positive opportunity, a business opportunity for somebody. Again, don't hesitate you know, to keep track of where you fit, but also don't hesitate to share information. You know, don't, you know, not so much that you're going to be doing business with this person, but again, keeps you aware of things in your field. It keeps you fit in government contracting. Uh, I can't emphasize that enough. So one of the things that you have to be ready, get ready for in my mind, is the matchmaker on November 17th and 18th, you know. FaceTime is very important. It's, it, it, it's valuable, it's necessary to establish relationships. You want that early engagement before you start talking contracts, before you're aware of contracts. So on November 17th and 18th, you know, remember people hire people, be a good listener, seek clarity, you know, do your homework. Um, you know, I don't want to sound like a PTAC commercial all the time, but that's really what you have to, to be, you know, be ready for. So these virtual programs, you know, we're not sure how they're going to, I don't know how they're going to work. Um, but whoever you have an appointment with, um, and you're going to use your NAICS code to fit, uh, and which is a good idea as far as, you know, who, who, who's, you know, these primes and these agencies are listing the NAICS they're looking for or do business with. That's who your meeting should be with. So that matchmaker homework uh, already set you up. Where you have to follow up is, okay, I have these five or six appointments. I'm going to follow and look at their website. I'm going to understand their mission. I'm going to understand their contract activities. I'm going to incorporate this information into meeting with them. I'm going to have a capability statement. You know, if you have five appointments, you should have five separate capability statements for November 17th and 18th. Uh, Rich, we have a question about how to make appointments for the matchmaker. Um, I can take that. So uh, if you've already registered for the matchmaker, you've done everything that you need to at this point. Uh, next week, we will be sending out uh, an email for the matches. Uh, we wait until closer to the event to do that so that we can get the maximum number of buyers uh, in the system before we start doing the matches because we have a, the buyers tend to take a lot longer to register. So you'll be getting additional information on that soon. That's it. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. I didn't know that. Good to know. Okay. So Okay, capability statements for each session. Even if the it's only even if you just have the last line of your core competency, you know, you have let's say you have five bullets under your core competency. That last bullet explains how you can contribute to that agency or prime contractor. You know, again, take something, just take a line from their website and paste it on your capability. 
if this, if it's, you know, if you find it difficult, but you want to, again, make sure you are addressing that on an individual basis. For these short discussions, and they're going to be short, I don't know the timing, but and don't ask me because I don't know the answer. Oh, don't, Jill, you know, this is becoming a Jill show. I, you know, I'm supposed to be talking and it's just going through Jill because she's smarter than me. We're getting That's away true. from See? Sharon That's Hopkins. Why I love Sharon, you can step in. <laughs> Sharon Hopkins, you can step in at any point and defend your staff, but if not, it's okay. So uh, you want to leave the clear, I'm, I'm joking folks. If you, you want to leave with a clear understanding of the next steps. You know, you want to make sure that whoever you meet with, that you leave there knowing a simple follow through for yourself. If they don't, if they don't give you something, ask them, how would you advise me to proceed? You know, show your interest, show you, you're actively seeking, seeking work with them. You know, you try to make sure that you are going to have the email of the proper official, whether it's that person you're meeting with or someone that works for that agency or, or prime, you know, make sure you have that before you leave that day. Uh, you know, maybe it's an outreach event, leave with something small, get some type of information. Also on this slide, we, we hit on industry days and vendor days. These are events kind of like a pre-proposal event to explain um, something specifically going on at that location or in that in industry. The reason I list, and again, folks, these are maybe just virtual now as compared to um, uh, live. The reason I, companies have done their research. They walk industry days, you know, with their teams already set up because they've been planning for this proposal for 18 months. So, if, you know, it's too late to, you know, look for a partner if it's, if it's something, uh, a very large quantity, and a lot of times they are. So that's why I call it picture day. That day, you'll know who the partners are because they walk in together. So please keep that, keep that in mind. Um, sources sought, industry days, requests for information. A lot of times they ask for a capability statement. I have a uh, five page sources sought I share uh, with my clients. Again, sources sought, used for their market research, for set-asides, very important here, 62% of sources sought actually end up as a set-aside. And that's important to understand and know because you have to look for that. Important to respond, to see if you fit, but you're also getting a great contact and someone that you can target if they are utilizing your NAICS code and your socioeconomic category, or just a small business set aside of which you are. And again, I use FedMind a lot of times to get that information for my clients for that very thing. So sources sought, RFI, request for information. Again, if nothing else, it's a good exchange of information. It, you have to be conscious of their procurement requirements, their compliances, uh, and we'll talk about that. Hopefully we have time to talk about that in a few minutes. But again, all this research, you have to start getting fit, getting engaged, so that you are taking advantage of what you've done so far and develop that into relationships and a better understanding. And one of the goals, and it's not, again, not easy, but you wanna have some type of influence. You wanna be able to demonstrate illustrate your expertise so that you are going to be heard, that you are going to be considered someone that they may want to do business with. And so some type of distinct feature, something that you've done in the commercial side that uh, has, has been successful, you know, in the same industry, same, you know, same type of framework, you'll know if they perk up, you'll know if they have something that they feel that they can also also utilize. And that really that, again, influence that idea of doing that, that's, that's a great skill, that's a great goal, and that's, you know, across any market, that leads to work. The best reference is, again, the best reference point is someone that thinks and has the same viewpoint, the same technical understanding, someone in your industry. 
I'm not, I'm in PTAC industry. I'm not in uh, IT. I'm not in construction. I have a basic understanding. I'm not an expert in that area. Okay. No, you know, the things you want to do are people in the same industry talking the same language. That is something you have to be able to show, hopefully, on the 17th and 18th. Show that you have solutions ready. Show that, you know, have their attention early in your discussions at the matchmaker. That's the first step to developing a business relationship. So if you can show you add value, show that you do fit at that particular primer agency or, you know, county agency or university, whatever it may be, that's the path in being part of their competitive selection process. I'm going to go on a little bit. Uh, so resource fitness, this is one of the things, and, and we had this earlier, uh, Billy from down Dayton did a great job at this uh, last week or two weeks ago, I can't remember. Um, Beta.sam.gov, replace FedBiz up. That's the starting point for federal opportunities. That's part of our bid search. Um, we also advise firms to, you know, look there to develop a strategy by seeing what's out there already, you know. So we, we definitely think this is something that needs your attention early on. Uh, I, I had a contracting officer tell me just, you know, about a month ago, um, opportunity doesn't waste time with those unprepared. So if you, you know, proposals take time and, and to develop proposal and proposal writing is not an easy thing to do. What I advise my clients a lot of times is just take an R demo, you know, make sure it's something in your area, look at it and try to start it and develop your own individual company response. Um, Sources sought is a good place to look at as sought, you're not providing pricing, you're just, you know, hey, here's what my company does, you know? And again, they will ask for um, five pages, 10 pages over that page limit. That's rule one, number one, be compliant with that. Um, but, uh, beta.gov through P look on your own um, look for understand set asides how do you match up what are the standards and then you start developing your response pair again it may be just for the source aside or small dollar contract but you're gonna have to do it five or six times you know uh, rewriting the proposal to make it closer to what you're going to just like anything else you have to practice, practice, practice. Um, after time, you'll be good at it and you can cut and pay. And that's, you know, you're telling your trying to get work. You know, keep that, keep that in mind. Hey, Rich, can you expand so, on what the uh, CSO is? CSO is commercial special offering. Uh, is kind of like the cousin of the transaction authority where they are going to expedite the process, and you can see that through um, beta.sam.gov. One of the things, I have a few clients uh, that on the innovative side, they've had some success with SBIRs, and I look in FedMind daily. I have a, so I have a search in FedMind for um, first-time contracts in Ohio, and also, and that's because the people at FedMind treat me like family and they do whatever I ask. So these daily hits of first time contractors and also anytime the government is requesting uh, commercial special offerings or OTAs and depending on the NAICS code, I send that to my clients where it's a matchup. I do the same thing with sources sought. So if it's sources sought is uh, five, four, one, six, whatever, you know, number is five, four, one, five, one, nine. I look in dynamic small business contractors. There may be three or four and then the source is sought, just miss it. I do the same thing with commercial special offering and uh, get those hits. I plug into dynamic small business search. I look in all, I send it out to, you know, you can do the same thing through 
uh, beta.sam.gov, or you can see CSOs um, through your PTAC search if you want to, but then you don't, you don't get the, the code. But again, something that has gone on innovatively, private side, they're asking for it, they're uh, on the federal government side, and they can use that vehicle to process it quicker. Uh, it's a competitive selection. It's not, you know, with, but you, you would, you know, write goals. Okay, quickly, because I'm out of time, and I have quite a few slides to go. So, uh, on the review process. So we've gone through all the market research. Now we're just thinking about opportunities. First place you look, beta.sam. You know, you also want to look through your PTAC bid match. Set up a search you get from 3,500 sites. That's good stuff. Do research. Um, does this opportunity early on meet my fitness test? Is it in next code? Is it something that I can handle? So part of that early review, and I, I you know, I go back to these three basic areas: the kind of work, work, you know, a instructions, the bidder, and C certain evaluation criteria. You know, are we a fit? The evaluation criteria, especially. Uh, what ways, you know, what, you know, how much do they weigh past performance? How much is weighed? How much is the material that we have utilized? You know, is that a value? Um, quality assurance, technical expertise, you know, uh, sometimes there's a requirement for uh, socioeconomic at the state level, MBE or edge, whatever it may be. All of that is part of the proposal framework that you had before you know, submit your, you kind of, if it's something good, okay, I'm going to spend more time on this one. You scan it and say, that's not me, you know, okay. But proposals are not always public anymore. I think that's very important to understand. So not everything is going through beta.sam.gov, especially as they try to expedite the process. So 52% of all federal contracts now run through some type of cooperative like the G Fed IT vehicles like STARS or this. The state also has these mechanisms. The state has state schedule, master maintenance agreement, MMA, that our ed in Ohio has especially the GSA contracts also have a cooperative agreement that can be at the state level. One of the things I was talking to you in the university guidelines that I was able to push through, and again, what did I, I did research, my buddy that was down in Miami of Ohio had in their terms and conditions and their buying agreement that they other competitive selection processes, GSA, like state term schedule. Hey, Rich, I'm There's sorry. There's two other ones you're, that I don't You're breaking up. Uh, the last couple sentences you've given, I don't know if it's because of all of the rain or, or maybe the broadband, but uh, you broke up pretty bad uh, for the last like two minutes. I'll go back. Did you hear me talk about the 52%? I heard that, yes, but it was... Yeah, I heard the 52% of all requirements. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll start there. Oh, and they, they're saying- I'll, start, I'll go back there. I'll okay, go back there. Okay, very good, thank you. So 52% of all contracts are running through cooperative agreements like the GSA, like the federal, 
IT has their own vehicles, STARS. We also have these cooperative agreements, price agreements at the state level, at the level of the higher education. So at the state, state term schedule in Ohio, also for the state of Ohio, MMA, not listed here, master maintenance agreement. That means an agency can just get schedule and I already do three quotes from people there and they negotiate the price. Same thing with the higher education in Ohio, University Council price agreements Those are competitive selections. So you go to the IUCPG, you register as a supplier, you list what your uh, commodities are and they should send you the proposal uh, whenever it is out in a timely fashion so you can compete. Most of these are multi-award, which is important. And again, there are a lot of cooperative agreements to be utilized at every level. And that is something your research and you need to go to be able to fit. You know, as part of your fitness test, you need to fit. And the best way to do it is to be on one of these vehicles or to be a sub, as we mentioned, a sub to someone on GSA. These, you know, all these vehicles are utilized on a regular basis. And more and more, again, why? They don't have to go through that business, I'm sorry, they don't have to go through that bidding process. Bidding process is utilized uh, by environment over a small amount, and they can still just do full quotes, utilize SAT. They don't always publish that, they just do it on their own. They may do it after market research, they may do it for, from people they already have in their database or people they did business with. They can do whatever they want, okay? Please come But the cooperative agreements, like the IUCPG, they are seeking leverage. They're, you know, they're avoiding the open market. They're getting qualified people that they like, that they want the price, the cost, to be lower than the regular market because of the high volume. You know, you put all these universities together and they're buying the same office supplies. They want the best price. That's what GSA says. We want your best price. You have to show on your GSA application, you have a price better than your commercial price schedule, better than or less than. Okay, that's a requirement. So again, understand that and move forward with that idea. The GWAC is a government-wide acquisition contract. It's, again, pre-competed, pre multiple award, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity, uh, and they use it for IT solutions. This is definitely a tread, trend in federal procurement. Agencies are lying on these contracts to you know, update their systems, and they're trying to get the best. And so a lot of times, these are from large contractors. But multiple award also means cost is very competitive. A firm can be easily replaced, you know, if it fails to deliver. As, you know, as the government moves forward with more commercial standard products and services, they're also sharing that data across agencies who they have their own acquisition. You know, we talked about acquisition.gov. So the GSA Acquisition Gateway is a portal utilized by federal buyers. They are able to review, model themselves, see the various sources, suppliers that are being utilized across federal government. And so you see, you know, if I'm a federal buyer, and I see these patterns, and I, I, I can look at these you know, selections. I can borrow, borrow their RFP template and also borrow the list of successful contractors. To them, they are getting a good price and they're avoiding risk. That makes it harder and harder for the small business. Trust me, that's important to understand. I'm skipping now to the next slide because I, I try to want to get through all this. So 
you make your initial review and now you're going to spend more time on it okay some of the basic things that you have to do uh, is to make sure that you have the you know do you have the identified NICS code are you going to get a good return on investment to pursue this opportunity do we have enough time to develop a response do we have key personnel that are required and are they available and we're a small company are they available do we have the technical past performance is it recent and relevant um, is it direct is it with this agency um, if you need to build a team do we have team members that already have a relationship with this customer is the incumbent bidding you know are we familiar with anybody on the incumbent team have we done work at this location do we do we understand the lab uh, categories is it firm fixed pricing you know all of this has to be well defined before you pursue the opportunity and that's really important you know I've, i once a month i'm talking to a client that the labor categories and how many full-time people are expected is not clear sometimes they do it careless sometimes they do it because they want the incumbent to win that's that's rich Lissio's opinion and not ohio university but you got to keep that in mind and you got to deal with it so when you start looking at responding to a proposal that's a skill you got to develop you know tell your own story just like you have to do your own capability statement you know i can tell you as a past procurement person we don't like passive language we don't like long sentences you want imperatives we shall do this we must do this we will do this be efficient with your words have an editor it's very important to have someone looking at it and and just making it the essential words and language um and this is my my example since 1994 and i maybe not this year but i know I, I did i saw this last year printed out but since 1994 to 2019 every oscar picture of the year also got film editor of the year okay you have and mike mike my editor for this program so if you don't like it, it's mike's fault but you really have to i can't emphasize that enough have an objective third party someone to edit it someone that's a very writer uh if you don't have that skill set have someone find someone to do it for you um and get a family member don't pay anybody for it but you have to support your facts with statistics with strong reasons that will match up to that industry knowledge that industry understanding you want to write to express not impress and again you may and this is what i tell people because of my wife days i'm evaluating 20 you might be number 20 i have to read by then i'm you know i'm getting punchy so keep that in mind you have to make sure it stands out uh make sure you have a good understanding of what they're looking for be concise make it hit that point rfp request for proposal service based it may have some negotiating involved rfq request for quote item line prices you know uh, distribution you know price is the king there okay that also comes into play you may only have five days to respond on a rfq and you know very little prep you gotta have it ready you gotta have everything ready whereas an rfp you can have from anywhere from 10 to 30 days to put that proposal together uh, again, explain it by itself that they're looking for a little bit more there. So this is after you send your proposal, you want to do your own self-evaluation. And again, this is very important to help you be an expert, be a proposal leader in the future. I have clients that, you know, they are aggressively pursuing writing proposals um writing bids they're on some of these vehicles and they have to you know they have to do everything but what they have is a knack to putting their company success 
in a very clear way and how they can meet the expectations of that federal or state agency. So immediately after your proposal goes in, you start that self-evaluation, you know? You, you gotta deal with, if you win the award, you gotta deal with some contract obstacles. If you don't win the award, you know, how are you going to deal with those? Look at it. You know, a lot of times you have to put it in your price high because you don't want to win. Because you think there's going to be obstacles involved. And so if you don't win, that's okay. It's better than not to make any money and, and all be miserable. But again, that's where you're also your, your pre-solicitation research will help you figure out if you want to do business with that agency. So, and again, the federal government, and, I, and I'm not trying to be negative here, but there's sometimes a disconnect between the processing contract officer and the program manager who implements the contract. So again, you have to make sure that's clear to you before you enter the proposal and it's not clear, don't dive. And if it's not clear, about your intellectual property, don't dive in. I had a, a contractor who, towards the end of their three-year contract, the replacing CO was insisting on the company's intellectual property. I mean, it was, it was like the last six months of the contract. That's, no, you're right. You know, I had the DCMA get in and tell back off because the new contracting officer didn't have a clue. I'm telling you that story because you have to know your rights, know the FAR, you know, anything that is not in the original contract, you just say, hey, that's fine. I need to be compensated for the additional request. End of story. That's how you move on that. Uh, if you lose, you ask for a debriefing. If you win, you want a post award, make sure you have, uh, you know, inning with that end user, that, that program person, that site, if it's going through a, a contracting officer, you now want to deal with the person that's going to be on that site. Make sure you can handle the delivery day. If you have any questions, just start the relationship early. The best advice that, that we can give. So I'm going to close with, with, you know, we talked about the acquisition viewpoint. Um, you want to be able to have that clear understanding. You know, again, they can select anyone they want. They can throw it out. They can throw it out and use one of those vehicles to avoid the process. Um, make sure you understand um, that you want a supplier relationship because you want to contribute to their success. A lot of what supply chain management is, is for them to reduce the risk, the uncertainty uh, within that chain. And, and you're seeing this, especially in DOD, they are limiting the number of suppliers and they are focusing on results and relationships. And the reason, in my opinion, Rich Delicio's opinion, more and more reliance from DOD is on the primes. And this is how they operate. The primes are more guarded in who's in their subcontracting chain. Maybe because of cyber, maybe because they don't want to get burned, but they're very careful in selecting new partners. So going that route, get a good understanding and you have to be small, start small, start with relationships, try to move as quickly through the chain a small dollar subcontracting tier, lower tier, you know, involvement. It's the best way I can explain it. Um, at times, it's very difficult to develop those relationships. You know, it's difficult from the standpoint of you're trying to do business at a uh, location, agency, and, you know, you have a new four-star general or you have a new contracting officer or you have a new program manager and it's starting all over. But that's also a good time to present yourself as an opportunity, as someone that they can utilize. So it, it, again, it kind of goes both ways. So you have to move forward 
try to understand that the acquisition people, especially the ones that you are doing business with, have to be, you know, they're doing a balancing act, okay? They're balancing what's needed, what suppliers they've used in the past. They have new personnel involved. Again, that four-star general I go back to. Um, the relationships are there and you have to <clears throat> try to make sure that you fit. And the best way to fit is with a good relationship with that acquisition person that kind of can coach you through it. Uh, I want to mention CPARS, Contractor Performance Assessment Report, um, watch your score. It's very important to stay informed there. Uh, it's CPARS, the past performance uh, is mentioned 87 times and far. I want you to understand it's very significant, very important. I recently had a excellent contractor. Um, they had an order that um, for some reason got canceled. They requested it to be reinstated. This particular contract had no DLA funds involved. What I mean by that is the company that requested it was a supply chain that tired of waiting. And so they no longer wanted the part. And so my client went through all these steps to get it ready and it never got reinstated. What I told my client was not to be concerned about the lost expenses as much as negotiate the language that will go into their CPARs because of the canceled order. That's more important to their long-term fitness. You know, one mistake at the federal level and, and you definitely fall from their good graces to the bottom of the list. So be aware of that. In summary, um, you know, communicate your message very clear, try to take good notes, try to develop relationships, do a lot of research, get, you know, you have to get everyone in your company on board. Um, you want people to know you're looking at government contracting. You want to have the marketing done correctly, capability statement, make that flexible. Um, and this is, is something that you have to develop over time. The more you can do as far as developing your resources, the better you're going to get at it. And I, I guarantee you, if you spend mid time after you do it for a year, years, you'll get closer and closer. You'll realize you're not a good have new resources in in other markets. And again, people go federal, some go state, some go universities, some go city. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. There's my information. It is 12 on the dot. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. I, I appreciate you getting through it. I think it was there was a lot of really, really good information. Uh, just to circle back briefly on capability statements, we had a question is of uh, should uh, should I have multiple capability statements? I think five was tossed around, and uh, should it be based on NAICS codes? Uh, again, your your flexibility should be on who's talking to at the matchmaker or who are you trying to act. So the next code to me is, is a small thing. Your past performance, if you are um, looking for federal work, you want federal past performance first. If you're trying to do work at a university, you want to list your university work first. If you are um, meeting an agency, uh, if you're meeting uh, the EPA on November 18th, you want to go to the EPA mission uh, statement and include that information, how you can contribute to that in your capability statement. So it's, you know, I say flexible in different versions, you cut and paste and it's very little, in my opinion, okay. Depends on the customer you're meeting with. It depends on the customer, absolutely. Um, Sharon, can you go back to the slide with Rich's contact information? Um, also, we had a, a question if any PTAC clients have ever uh, provided like a request for proposal, one that they did, but redacted information like personal information uh, that they could share with other people as an example. 
Do, are there example proposals that, that uh, PTAC ever provides? You know, I, I will share basic things, but I would rather, and what I tell my clients is to find their own, you know, so they can find their own. I'd help them find their own that could be dated. You know, I, I usually look at state outdated proposals for people to look at because they're on the internet and those are a little bit easier to go through than the federal. Um, so, I mean, uh, we, we do it all the time, but you know, we do not have a template nor do we think it's the best approach because everyone that does proposals does them differently. Trust me. So, um, you know, so the federal is different than the state state's different than the city. Um, each city's different, each county's different. Some things they share, but again, even within the IUCPG, those are all different because they're, they're farmed out to the various schools. So when I was at Youngstown State, we had two IUC price agreement bids that we did. Um, one was uh, chemical supplies, I remember, I can't remember. But anyways, so within that framework, I had two different buyers doing our two bids and some of the boilerplate first part is the same, but the language and the criteria and the request for information from the bidders is going to be different and they were sent out. So that I, I think it's important to understand that you, what you, when you start looking at proposals, they are a match for your industry. They are a match for your product or service. And there's a similarity there that you cut and paste the information you have to match up. That, that's, again, that's my experiences over the years. And it's a story. You have to learn to write it or have somebody write it for you, uh, just like anything else, just like Kate Willie's statement. You know, we can coach you through it, uh, but, we, you know, we're not going to do it for you. And you. And if you don't think you're good at it and you want to pay someone, pay someone, that's a business decision uh, on your own. All right, thank you, Rich. That was uh, that. I don't see any other questions in chat. I really appreciate your time today. I think it was very valuable. Uh, All right. Anyone has any other questions? Uh, Rich's contact information is there. And then, um, if you have a, a SBA question, I'll put this in the chat real quick. But my email is uh, Jill Reynolds at sba.gov. And I actually just sent that to Sharon only. All right. All right. Okay. Well, thank you, Rich. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, PTAC team. Thank Everyone have a good afternoon. Thanks. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Jill. All right. Thank you.